So I want to welcome everybody. This is our third event of the Bacon Immigration Law Speaker Series. And I just want to thank a few behind the scenes people. First of all, our wonderful and devoted clinics administrator, Carol Lee Taylor, who has eagerly embraced the logistical challenges in making these events go smoothly. Um, Professor Shafali Mikchar Desai has put in a lot of time in getting these events going. Philip Rohde, who's a law student, designed flyers and has been working um, fr from the beginning um, with students from ILSA to facilitate student engagement. Uh, today, Isai Estevez has worked with Philip to prepare some questions that will start off with the Q&A. And uh, Ben Laurence, who's a history professor and current law student, has suggested and helped facilitate the selection of each of our great speakers to date. So uh, just a good old-fashioned Zoom-like show appreciation for all you guys. Um, so far, we've been learning about the evolution of asylum law in the US and the ongoing barrage of attacks on the asylum system that has been causing so much human suffering. Um, I, I wanna thank all of you guys for taking the time to be here today and the immigration law faculty and Dean Miller are especially excited that these are issues that you all care enough to put your time and energy into. And just some quick, quick housekeeping matters before our speaker gets going. Uh, remember to keep yourselves mute for now, but also to unmute when you ask a question. It's easy to forget that part. Um, and our speaker is going to speak for maybe 20 or 30 minutes, followed by question and answering that Isai will start off. Um, and then we'll expand to, the, to everybody else. Um, and at that point, if you want to, you can um, put questions in the chat. You can raise your hand. I say you will. Um, we'll moderate that part. Um, but it's a real, it's a real honor for me to introduce Professor Harris. Um, and I apologize if I speak fast, but she has so many accomplishments as a teacher, scholar, human rights advocate um, that I do want to mention uh, a few of them. She is the director of the Immigration and Human Rights Clinic at the David A. Clark Law School in Washington, DC. And to give you an inkling of what that means, she not only teaches a biweekly clinic class and meets regularly with each team of students, but this morning she just came from a practice interview for an asylum seeker from Venezuela. She's within the next five weeks. Her to-do list includes three other asylum interviews and preps plus a trial in immigration court. And that is a lot. Um, but it's not all. She has designed and taught several other courses as well, uh, including a seminar in asylum and refugee law and a year-long course for clinical instructors who are LLM candidates. She's led uh, spring break trips with students to the Burks Family Detention Center and to Tijuana, Mexico to help asylum seekers. I'm going to skip some of her other teaching accomplishments, but I do want to mention that the American Immigration Lawyers Association recently recognized Professor Harris with the 2020 Elmer Freed, I hope I pronounced that right, Excellence in Teaching Award. Um, outside of law school, she serves as vice chair of the board of a project in DC that helps asylum seekers and vice chair of the National Asylum and Refugee Liaison Committee of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Before she became a law professor at the Clark School of Law, which was in 2016, Professor Harris worked with the American Immigration Council on efforts to end family detention of asylum seekers. And before that, at the Tahira Justice Center, she was first an Equal Justice Works Fellow and then a staff attorney working on the African Women in, Women's Empowerment Project. She earned her JD at Bolt from UC Berkeley, where she graduated as a member of the Order of the Coif. She was a student leader in many organizations at Bolt and won awards and did a lot of great things. But I think, but for our purposes, those include um, working with the Center for Gender and Refugee Studies and at the Berkeley Human Rights Center in South Africa. She also got a lot of hands-on experience through clinical work while in law school, hint, hint, to the law students in the audience. Um, after law school, she clerked for the late Harry Pregerson of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Professor Harris has published a lot of law review articles about asylum on topics including gender-based asylum claims and family detention, and she's written 
op-ed pieces that have been published in newspapers and magazines with wide readerships, like an article in this month's Ms. Ms. Magazine that puts a human face on the president's war on women seeking asylum. Um, I've personally witnessed Professor Harris's dedication to the cause of preserving asylum and promoting human rights lately, um, especially starting this summer through the listservs for immigration law professors. She encouraged uh, all of us to get in contact with our students, our communities, to um, generate individualized comments. And she organized Google spreadsheets and information articles to make that easy for us and was kind of raw, raw, cheater leader, inspirational, really, to all of us. And she's been really awesome in, in this, you know, re relentless barrage of regulations to, you know, attacks. Um, I want to end by saying that she does all of this while raising a toddler named Dennis, a six-year-old named Adelina, and a 12-year-old black and tan coonhound lab mix named Nelson. So Professor Harris, thank you so much for carving out time to, in your overpacked schedule, to be here to prepare this talk, first of all, and to be with here with us today. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much for that overly kind um, introduction, Professor Marcus. I really appreciate you all being with me here today on this Friday afternoon, or I suppose lunchtime for you all. And I really appreciate everyone who put this together, Professor Lawrence and Carol and Shafali and the students, Philip and Isai. Um, just, I feel very fortunate to be here today. I did manage to attend or at least watch the presentations by Professor Musello and, and P Professor Marouf. And I'm honored to follow in their footsteps. I've seen a really engaged, wonderful audience and community that you all have. And so I've been looking forward to today and hoping that I can try and build on what you have already discussed and add to that a little bit. So like any good clinical professor, I'm going to start with my goals for today um, in this presentation. We are gonna talk about asylum being under attack. Um, we're going to build on the, oops, sorry, fantastic talks um, by the professors uh, who've spoken to you previously in these series and do a quick review of the ways in which asylum is under attack. And those are new and evolving every week. Um, but I'm then going to spend some time sharing the preliminary results of a survey I did, a study of asylum attorneys, more than 700 nationwide, measuring levels of burnout and secondary traumatic stress, because obviously these have, as Professor Marcus said, profound human impacts on the asylum seekers we're working with, um, but also for the advocates um, from the paralegals, um, you know, legal assistants, board accredited representatives to the attorneys who actually are doing this work day in and day out. And that has an effect on the work we do, the quality of it, and our clients too. So I'll spend a little bit of time too thinking about um, how we build sustainable careers as individuals and in, in institutions and in law school. So before I do start, I just wanted to ask if you all would just type into the chat work chat box, what is one word that comes to mind when you think about asylum? The first word that pops into your mind, and this will be different today than it was a couple of years ago or five years ago. Um, so I'm seeing danger, refuge, human right, jail. That is a reality right now, especially under this administration torture, escape, safety, freedom, right? So some of the positive things that we're seeking through asylum. Um, family, family ties are key. Thank you all for playing along. Um, so asylum is all of these things, right? It is uh, this protected category of immigrants. And so I think that's in conversations with colleagues, that's one of the reasons why the all out assault on asylum in some ways feels like just this um, relentless attack on something where you thought that this was safe, right? For our other clients, for our undocumented clients who are struggling with other issues and don't have very limited avenues for relief, um, of course, the onslaught of anti-immigrant measures has been terrible, but asylum was kind of historically this protected category where you were like, okay, we can eke out an asylum claim here. Maybe this person will be okay. Um, and one colleague was sharing with me that that's why she feels that this is just affecting her so profoundly. So I'm not going to go in any great depth into the ways in which asylum has been undermined, um, but because I did watch Professor Musala's talk, I was present for that, and I know that Professor Maruf touched on a lot of this too. 
So I won't go into it in any depth, but from the metering, the policies at the border, and these are kind of chronological, um, where we were only letting in a few asylum seekers at a time. And even just today, uh, reports have come out um, from CBP saying that really they did have capacity and they were lying when they said they, they didn't to process people at the border, which we knew, but now we have more concrete evidence. Um, family separation and zero tolerance, I'll talk briefly about that. I won't talk about asylum ban 1.0 as it's known and asylum ban 2.0 because Professor Musolo did touch on those um, quite a bit in terms of trying to block people who are seeking asylum and entering in between ports of entry. Um, and also people who had transited through other countries and not sought asylum. The migrant protection protocols, I know we've discussed in this series, we'll just touch briefly on those. And then the attorney general decisions to try and undermine protection, particularly for those fleeing gender and gang related violence um, to the asylum cooperative agreements. All of this has really happened in the last four years, less than four years. Asylum cooperative agreements with Guatemala, Honduras and El Salvador um, to send people elsewhere. The fees for asylum and the new rules for work permits, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the pedantic uh, rejection of asylum applications, the COVID ban at the border, and then to my count, at least seven sets of proposed regulations between December 2019 and October 2020 that specifically focus in on undermining asylum protection. So we're not going to talk about these in any depth, so that's my warning to you. Um, I have an article I'm happy to share with you on this topic, uh, on all of these topics in more depth, um, but we'll just kind of skim through them and then we'll get to the, the survey results. Um, so family separation, right, as you know, this is really what catapulted asylum seekers into the spotlight. This was the moment, at least in my career, where when I said I was an asylum attorney, people didn't say, oh, you mean like mental asylum, <laughs> uh, insane asylum? They understood asylum seekers, that's an immigration thing. Those are people fleeing persecution, refugees. Um, so this really, of course, is where Jeff Sessions and his um, cronies put into place this policy where families were separated at the border because they were prosecuting everybody, even asylum seekers for, quote, illegal entry or illegal re-entry for entering without papers and documentation, which as you know, that's the only way you can actually do it as an asylum seeker. Um, or you could go to the port of entry and ask for asylum, but then you're going to be told to go away and come back another day or put on this, this list that they claim doesn't exist. Um, so of course, family separation, there's a lot of talk about this even in the presidential debates, was happening a little bit under the Obama administration in different ways, but certainly not on this scale and with this level of intentionality. And of course, we also know that the kids still haven't, some of the kids over 500 still haven't been reunited with their families. Um, so this ended, right, ostensibly ended, um, thanks to huge public outcry and protests across the country, combined with litigation efforts and eventually an executive order um, from President Trump. It didn't really end things and there's no real plan as to what to do um, with children and parents who are arriving together and seeking protection or entering the US. Um, this is the image from the July 2018 Time Magazine cover after the Trump administration had reversed the policy. Um, but there's a lot still going on in this arena. We know, of course, remain in Mexico. Um, there has been a new lawsuit filed against this policy just this week. The previous attack on, uh, legal attack on, on Remain in Mexico on the migrant protection protocols, most of us advocates say migrant persecution protocols, is still pending. At one point, the Ninth Circuit had actually stayed the policy, so MPP was going to come to an end, but the Supreme Court intervened and they um, lifted the stay and they will now hear the case sometime in early 2021. But this is the policy, as you'll all probably remember, that sends people who are seeking asylum back to Mexico to await the adjudication of their claim. So I looked up the numbers yesterday and it's about 68,000 people now waiting along um, border towns in Mexico in incredibly unstable, precarious, dangerous situations where they are targeted um, in a six month period, Human Rights First found more than a thousand documented instances of violent attacks on asylum seekers. And of course, it's very difficult for attorneys to get to these clients and to provide representation to them. 
So when we're thinking about the, the effects for the attorneys of this work on them, you have attorneys traveling back and forth between the US and Mexico, actually putting themselves at great risk, sometimes getting threats from cartels, getting extortion demands on their own personal cell phones, and, and they are at risk going back and forth. Um, and some of the people who responded to my survey spoke about that, feeling like they could be harmed for the work they're doing both outside and within the US by folks who are mobilized by this xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, so most people don't have lawyers in MPP. It's about 7% of people, only almost 5,000 of the 68,000 people have attorneys. And we know, you probably all know, that it's quite well documented that having an attorney can make a huge difference in asylum claims. Um, I'm not going to spend much time here, but you probably recall, I'm just going over this for people who maybe didn't go to the two previous um, lectures on this on asylum, but measure of AB was the decision by the Attorney General Sessions in 2018 to try and undermine gender-based asylum. So trying to generally say, and he also went beyond the, the case in front of him, which was a case based on, based on domestic violence and tried to throw in anything involving domestic violence or gang violence um, perpetrated by people who are non-government actors, so people who aren't government persecutors. Um, so Professor Marouf talked about this one, but there was also recently another decision from our current Attorney General, Bill Barr, um, matter of ACAA, which just came out in September, I believe, and that was uh, attacking gender-based asylum again and knocking down the group of Salvadoran females. So he's trying to go uh, attack gender and nationality as a particular social group formulation. And I know you spent a lot of time thinking about particular social group formulations a couple of weeks ago with Professor Maria, so I won't dwell on that, although coming up with and, and thinking through particular social groups is one of my favorite not favorite things. Um, LEA, this is the decision that um, reversed a decision. It, it changed a decision from 2017. The 2017 decision actually didn't grant asylum to Mr. LEA, who was a Mexican asylum seeker, but that wasn't good enough for this administration. It did have some language that recognized family, family ties as a particular social group. And in 2019, Bill Barr came in and said, oh, we just wanna make clear, even though he didn't get asylum, we also just wanna say that usually families are not going to be recognized as meeting those three requirements for a particular social group, social distinction, particularity, and um, specifically. And so he tried to draw this distinction between kind of prominent kinship and clan groups. That's why I have, you know, Mel Gibson from Graveheart here, like, do you have to be part of this clan? Um, or maybe the Kardashians or the Trumps or the Clintons in order to get asylum. Um, so his concern is that, you know, if we recognized everybody as families as particular social groups that would render virtually every alien every asylum seeker uh, a member of a particular social group but we all are also members of other grounds right we all presumably have a race and a nationality and potentially political opinions um, and re potentially religions or lack thereof and so that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense either but it is another broad attack on asylum We've then seen the administrations doing things in, ter in terms of bilateral agreements with other countries. So prior to 2019, we just had the one agreement with Canada, which has actually kind of been struck down by the Canadian um, Constitutional Court for violating Canadian constitutional rights um, and due process for asylum seekers, uh, meaning that the US is not a safe place for asylum seekers, according to Canada's highest court in the land. So what we've done with the Trump administration sign agreements with Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, um, which is obviously highly controversial within those countries, um, but also these countries do not have robust asylum systems. They're not non-existent, and Mexico um, has a pretty robust asylum system. Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras still kind of working on it. Um, the Guatemalan agreement was actually implemented pre-COVID and more than 900 people never had the chance to seek asylum in the US. They were deported to Guatemala where they went through that system. The numbers of people who actually went through that system are abysmal, I think, and less than 100 of them. Um, the other agreements were about to be implemented and then COVID hit, so they're kind of on pause, but they exist. So that's a new thing that has happened under this administration. Um, another thing I want to highlight is the potential fees for asylum. This is a maybe less publicized way that the administration has tried to 
undermine access to asylum protection. Um, but there was an executive order from Trump basically saying set up fees for asylum. And so the proposed fee is only $50, but $50, as you know, if you're working with clients who are fleeing with nothing or have spent everything already to get here can actually be a barrier. Um, so these new fees are actually enjoined right now. There's a fee for the first time work permit, which used to be free, um, which is actually gonna add up to $550. Um, they're currently enjoined thanks to litigation challenging these, this fee increase in addition to a whole broad base of other fee increases um, for immigration petitions more broadly. Um, but it, these are bad and recent regulations would actually require people even in detention to file their asylum application along with a fee and a receipt for the fee within 15 days of first going to court, which if you've ever practiced asylum law or tried to file an asylum application and get a receipt within 15 days, that's just unheard of, um, just not even possible. So they're just putting up all these bureaucratic barriers and hurdles to the very process of seeking asylum. Um, same with the work permit changes. So there were pretty comprehensive regulations proposed that have been partially enjoined by a district court in Maryland. And I say partially enjoined because not all of the harmful provisions of these regulations that undermine access to work authorization for asylum seekers have been enjoined, just, if, just some of them. And it actually only applies to members of the two plaintiff organizations, um, Casa de Maryland and the Asylum Seeker Advocacy Project, ASAP. So what the work permit changes tried to do was change the waiting period from five months after you file for your asylum claim, 150 days, to a whole year. So you're here and you have to wait for 365 days after you filed your asylum application, which is in my experience, usually about six to 10 months after you get here, um, because it's a, you know, currently 12 pages, probably soon to be 16 pages, tiny font, convoluted form, only available in English. So often people are trying to find an attorney and you know there aren't enough legal services, especially pro bono and low bono. So this is just another way to, to block people's access to asylum and also their ability to survive while they go through the asylum process and wait for their claims to be adjudicated. Um, these changes also um, make it impossible for you to get a work permit in two other situations. One is if you enter with between ports of inspection, if you enter without inspection, um, as many asylum seekers do because they're desperate and they can't wait 10 months, a year and a half, however long in Mexico. Uh, they can't afford to do so. It is not safe for them to do so. So they decide to enter in between ports of entry. They'll never be eligible for a work permit unless they're granted asylum in the end. And their case could, as we know, um, immigration court backlogs are more than a million cases, around 350,000 or so at the asylum office. And so it could be years before they have the permission to work, even if they win their claim. Um, same thing for anyone who files past the one-year filing deadline wouldn't be eligible for a work permit, just categorically ineligible until a judge or an asylum officer finds that they meet an exception to the one-year filing deadline, which again, they're not going to do for many years. Um, so some of these changes have been enjoined if you are a member of those two plaintiff organizations, and it's quite easy to become a member actually, um, even ex post facto or after the fact, but other provisions that are harmful in here are, haven't been enjoined. I have a hearing on November 18th before a notoriously anti-immigrant white supremacist quite openly judge um, for a Honduran asylum seeker fleeing domestic violence. I know he won't grant her case. And actually these new changes say that once your case is denied by an immigration judge, your work permit terminates rather than have it be valid while you go through your appeal with the Board of Immigration Appeals as it was before no idea whether they're actually tracking and enforcing that new rule yet, as with many of the new pernicious, very small um, regulatory changes they've come up with, but it could definitely be hard. Um, related to all of this is also just the rejections of asylum applications. So these are just a couple of articles in The Guardian and then a piece in The Washington Post on this. Um, around October 2019, USCIS, the agency that processes asylum applications, just started rejecting <laughs> asylum applications um, for not filling in, for example, um, not putting in NA or none in a, in a box and leaving it blank, maybe because it didn't apply to you. I have an example of this that I'll show you from my practice. 
Um, or maybe your photo where, that you submit with your asylum application, you're supposed to write your name and alien number, your nine digit number on the back. If you wrote that in pencil instead of pen or vice versa, I can't actually remember which one it's supposed to be and I've filed hundreds of these, but it's never mattered before. But now doing the wrong thing there will get that application rejected and sent back to you. So here's another example from the form. Um, so here's the form where you have to write about your parents and siblings. So I've got, you know, mom, dad, brother, sister, and then there's two other boxes. So, you know, you might have four siblings or more and you'd need to add them on a supplement. But let's say you just have two. So you put down brother Jones, sister Jones, and you don't put anything else in those other two lines. And that's all you did wrong on the 12 forms, but a failure to write none or NA or a dash or something there means your form is rejected. And that also means that many more people are rejecting, are, are missing their one-year filing deadline. Um, and although there's a technical exception to that, it means that for the purposes of getting your work permit with their new regulatory changes I just discussed, you wouldn't get a work permit. If you had this sent back to you, usually it takes them about six to eight weeks to send it back to you. Um, and obviously this is really difficult for people who are not represented, but even as somebody who's filed 200, probably 50 plus <laughs> asylum applications in my time. Uh, I had a client whose application was rejected twice before they accepted it a third time. And because they take so long to reject it each time, that actually means from the time of first filing to the time it was actually given a receipt, it's been a delay of six months for that client. So a six month delay in her work eligibility. And now also she has this one year filing deadline problem. So super persnickety, pedantic rejections of asylum applications. And this is still happening across the board. Um, the COVID ban. So in conjunction with the Center for Disease Control, DHS announced in March that it would bar entry to all migrants at the southern border. And there's been other various iterations of this playing out. But basically, the administration has used COVID and the pandemic as a pretext to keep out asylum seekers in particular. And the UNHCR has spoken on this and of course said that if you impose a blanket measure to preclude the admission of refugees or asylum seekers without any evidence of an actual concrete health risk and without measures to protect against sending them back to their home country, for those of you familiar with the language against, non -re against reformant, right, the risk of sending someone back to a place where they would be harmed, that's discriminatory and it doesn't meet international standards. Um, so there's been lawsuits to challenge this filed in DC, a couple of different lawsuits. Um, so we'll see what happens with those. And But they have also been using this provision under the Public Health Act, which I was never familiar with as an immigration attorney before. But under Title 42 of the Public Health Act, federal officials can exercise unique powers during a pandemic to respond to a public health crisis. So a lot of what they are doing is under this Title 42 of the Public Health Act, but there's been close to 200,000 people, including many unaccompanied minors, and you've probably seen that in the news, the kids being kept in hotels, never having access to attorneys or anything, and just being sent back to their country of origin. So there's a lot. We're almost done with the parade of horribles, I promise, um, although I'm not going into everything. So finally, I'll just mention the attempts by the administration to eviscerate asylum protection through the regulatory process. So again, I think it's about seven sets of regulations in the last year or less actually to undermine asylum protection. The ones that made the biggest splash and these are the kind of op-eds and <laughs> headlines I'm pulling um, from were, are known as the monster asylum regulations or the death to asylum regulations. And those are the ones that Professor Marcus uh, mentioned me working on over the summer, but these were huge. And actually, in response to these, there were 88,000 public comments submitted. So the intention with that was to try and slow down the rulemaking process so that they would not be issued um, during this administration. We have yet to see whether that will be successful or not, because we still have until at least January 20th or whatever it is, um, even if the election goes to the Democrats. Um, so this is just one of the regulatory changes. I'm not going to go through all seven, although I do in my article. Um, these were pretty huge though. Um, we commented on these uh, by July 15th. So they were over the summer, but there's been several more sets of regulations proposed since then. Um, but these were sweeping changes 
trying to do through regulation what they have been trying to do through the case law, through the attorney general decisions. So um, really focusing on claims for people from Central America, um, but trying to make it very difficult for you to be granted asylum based on gender or any harm from non-state, non-government actors. Making it clear that this administration only wants to see asylum seekers who are the very classic political dissidents, probably from countries where people are preferably white. Um, and, and it's unclear whether they really want those either anyway. Um, so they prohibit evidence of cultural stereotypes, pernicious cultural stereotypes, while at the same time perpetrating cultural stereotypes in almost everything they do. They try and raise the standard for persecution. They try and raise a bunch of different negative discretionary factors that judges would have to consider, including working without authorization or not filing taxes in a timely way and more, um, and a bunch more bars to asylum. So including everything they've been trying to do through the, the asylum bans, um, the presidential proclamations. Um, so transit through another country, if you were there for 14 days, that would be a bar. Whew, so it's a lot, right? Um, if you'd like to see someone do that a little bit better, you should probably watch the John Oliver special on asylum that he did on Sunday um, with, an, with a more British accent. And um, probably as a non-expert, it was flooring to me how well he summarized all of it. Um, and with a little bit more humor than me too. So what does this mean for attorneys? Um, I haven't even covered all of the actions that the Trump administration has taken against asylum seekers. And we certainly don't have time to do that today. Um, but I wanna focus in on the rest of our time together is what does this mean for immigration attorneys and specifically asylum attorneys? So media, not mainstream media, but some media is starting to pick up on this issue. There was a great piece um, this week in The Prospect by Marsha Brown titled The Loneliness of Immigration Law. And she interviewed uh, immigration attorneys 12 across the country. And she talked to me about my study too and highlights kind of the effects this is having on immigration lawyers. Um, you know, no end in sight. What happens when immigrants rights advocates reach a, bracing, a, a breaking point? There was a Law 360 article. There was a, an opinion in, featured by NBC News at the bottom. But we know that asylum attorneys and immigration attorneys are struggling with this. And we actually know that attorneys are struggling more generally. So 2020 saw the very first National Lawyer Wellbeing Week. It probably, you probably blinked and mixed it, missed it because it was kind of right in the beginning of the pandemic. But there was a whole national task force that came out with a report in 2018. And then this week focused on attorney wellbeing in 2020 because we know that attorney mental health in general is a concern. The levels of suicide, depression, substance abuse, alcoholism are really high, disturbingly high among immigration, among lawyers and immigration lawyers too, but that it starts in law school as well. So what I did was this survey earlier this year of asylum attorneys. So there were around 900 and something attorneys who actually clicked on the survey and then 718 who completed it. And it was very much launched pre-COVID. I mean, I didn't really grasp that COVID was coming at the time. I'm not sure if I would have launched the survey or not. Um, so it was basically between February 25th and March 15th. Um, half of the people, about 329 people actually took it pre-COVID lockdown, which I kind of had as March 15th. And then 389 took it after March 15th. So pretty even. Um, interestingly, if you took the survey after March 15th, people actually ended up having some lower stress, especially for um, avoidance related to symptoms of trauma, so avoiding your client work, um, and actually burnout levels were slightly lower, but it wasn't statistically significant. So I did gather people's demographic details, age, race, gender, um, where they're practicing, which circuit court law was relevant for them, their office size and also their office type. So office type I had broken into kind of solo practitioner, small firms, medium firms, NGOs, and then people in academia. Um, the number of paralegals or support staff they had, the number of just volume of asylum cases they handled. I did also break down detained versus non-detained. And then their you know, normal number of estimated working hours that they work. Um, a week. And then I used questions um, from two well-known um, scales to measure um, burnout, the Copenhagen burnout inventory and the um, secondary traumatic stress scale. And I'm not a psychologist, 
I have an undergraduate degree in psychology. So I worked with a well-known psychologist, Stuart Lustig, and a doctor um, to come up, make sure I was doing this right. And then I had an open-ended question at the end. So it, burnt, it there's lots of different names, right, for the same phenomena. So we could talk about secondary trauma, compassion fatigue, secondary victimization, burnout, countertransference, empathetic strain, um, secondary PTSD, there's lots of different words for it. And I don't think for our purposes that it's super important what the terms actually are. Um, we just, we don't have time to go into the precise definitions and the differences, although there are some. The takeaway point really is that asylum attorneys and likely immigration attorneys as a whole are not okay. Um, so the Copenhagen burnout inventory measures on a scale of zero to hundred kind of your burnout in three dimensions. So your kind of personal burnout, your work burnout, and then the burnout that's kind of related specifically to the client work um, you're doing. And then the secondary traumatic stress, and then it gives you also an overall burnout number. The secondary traumatic stress scale does the same kind of thing. Um, as you probably know, secondary traumatic stress actually mirrors PTSD. So if we think about what you know about post-traumatic stress disorder, and hopefully you have a little bit of background on this, and if not, I'm happy to give more in the questions, um, but you would expect to be diagnosed with PTSD, you would have to actually have all of these symptoms. So intrusive thoughts, right? You lose the ability to control when you think about the harmful event that you've suffered, the trauma that you've suffered, arousal. So you might not be able to sleep. You might be kind of irritable or distractible in a different way. And then avoidance symptoms too. So not wanting to actually interact with people in the case of an asylum seeker from your home country or to talk about what you've been through. Um, lots of, and for us, not wanting to think about or write about or do the work on a client's case if you're having secondary traumatic stress. Um, so all of these things are measured individually, but then also an overall score. So before I get into the statistically significant findings, and again, I'm not a social scientist, so I've been working with someone on all the data and numbers, um, but I think we've dumbed it down enough for me, at least as a lawyer and a non-statistician. Um, I just want to share with you a few of the many, many quotes. Um, so a lot of people took me up on the opportunity to add any other thoughts they had at the end of the survey. So there's literally hundreds of them, and I just picked a few that are representative. So I think this administration has generated a generation of public service workers with serious PTSD from the absolute chaos and horror of the changes in the immigration system. It feels like we're all drowning and there's no one to save us. It's like hacking away at a cement wall with a plastic spoon. I love this one. There are no words to describe how awful it is to tell a client they have to go back to the place where they're in so much danger that the law doesn't protect them, even especially after we grow so close to our clients. Last one. Many times I felt the urge to, and Frank, my clients, hide them in my house. I can't, of course, but since there's no legal justice, aren't we compelled to do something else? Civil disobedience sometimes seems the the only way, but we can't do that because then we undermine our ability to help more people. But then it's like, are we even helping? Or by participating in the system, are we giving credence to the system and propping it up? These questions have no good answers, but near every day is heartbreak. And there were a number of responses that talked about feeling complicit in the system by participating within it, within a broken system, a broken discriminatory biased system. So there's a lot that I could pull out of those um, quotes at the end of the survey. Some things that were very consistent with prior studies, because there have been a few studies, not many of asylum, seek of, of asylum lawyers. There was one in the UK of 70 asylum lawyers in the last year, um, so a very small sample size. And then there was one like a decade ago of I think 56 asylum lawyers. Um, similar findings um, and similar findings just of um, attorneys in general, um, regardless of what kind of work they do. But prior studies like my study have found that being female is actually uh, people who identify as female in terms of gender identity um, is predictive of higher burnout and secondary stress, stress trauma st scores. So we can think about why that might be. Um, and then weekly hours are predictive of higher secondary trauma, interestingly, but not statistically significant for higher burnout. So more secondary trauma, but not necessarily burnout. Um, so 
this is consistent with other studies too that found that the more you are exposed to trauma, the more trauma exposed clients you work with, the higher your symptoms may be in terms of um, secondary traumatic stress. Um, I will say in other studies too, this is not something I measured in my study and I wish I had. Um, other studies have found that women who had experienced a direct trauma in their own lives, in their personal lives, and worked more hours a week also were at risk of heightened symptoms of things like depression and anxiety. So some novel things that I found um, were that, um, you know, just comparing, there was a study done of immigration judges in 2008 and measuring, using the exact same two scales. And basically we found that unsurprisingly, asylum attorneys in 2020 are higher on levels of burnout and secondary traumatic stress than immigration judges. Um, it was only statistically significant for people who are identified as Middle Eastern or North African attorneys, but every non-white group of attorneys measured higher on both scales for burnout and secondary traumatic stress than the white attorneys. Now, it wasn't really statistically significant, probably because the numbers were quite low. So like other studies of immigration lawyers, my study had um, predominantly white females um, responding. I think the Middle Eastern North African attorneys, there were like 11. There were 154 attorneys who identified as Latinx or Hispanic and kind of smaller numbers of everything else. Um, there were lower stress levels that were statistically significant for attorneys practicing in the third and fourth circuit. Fourth circuit makes sense to me in some ways because we have increasingly in the last decade in my circuit, the fourth where I practice, had some really progressive good um, asylum cases, asylum decisions. Solo practitioners had higher levels of secondary traumatic stress than any other attorneys. So people who were in nonprofits, academia, small firms, big firms, the solos are more stressed out and have higher levels of traumatic stress, which makes sense. And overall, the number of support staff does reduce overall burnout. So there's a lot that I didn't measure here. Um, for example, I didn't actually do years of practice, um, which might have been helpful. The UK study, the very small study of 70 attorneys did find that there were, um, if you were had fewer years of practice, your levels of stress um, were higher. Um, although they also, I didn't look at supervision and they found in some instances, supervision made you more stressed and in other instances, supervision made you less stressed. And we can all imagine why. Depends on the quality and type of supervision you have. Um, I also did not measure um, prior trauma in the attorney's lives personally. That's not something I asked about. And I didn't ask about childcare or other um, caregiving responsibilities, which might have been highly relevant um, based on, on coronavirus and what we've all been living through now. So that's kind of just the preliminary results of the survey. Um, I think a lot of the questions uh, might be about kind of what do we do with this information? So how do we move forward? These findings are not surprising in any way. Um, but what do we do about this clearly documented levels of stress and burnout? And, and they are high. Uh, among asylum attorneys. And do we have to do anything about it? Uh, I'll just briefly say that I would argue we should, um, because actually having symptoms of vicarious trauma in particular is going to undermine some of the most fundamental aspects of the attorney-client relationship. And if you don't actually take action on this and monitor how you're doing throughout your representation, then there might actually be ethical issues and there could be issues around malpractice and disbarment because if you think about some of our obligations, we have to be competent, right? That means we have to be um, engaging thoroughly and preparing for each client. We have to be diligent. We have to communicate with our clients. If we're avoiding communicating with them because we're having secondary traumatic stress, that's a problem. Um, and this also brings in responsibilities of a supervisor too. So a few ideas, and then I'd love to hear yours as well. Um, what do we need to change in asylum practice? Um, one is, you know, name it to tame it. So the fact that we're even having some discussions around this is positive because in my second little box there, one of the keys to preventing secondary trauma is actually prevent is actually understanding what it is. So awareness actually can help prevent and minimize symptoms of um, secondary trauma. And then we need to think about individual self-care. But I think going beyond the individual, we need to be thinking about institutional self-care. So what do we do as law schools, as law firms, as nonprofits, as other entities? Um, so law school, I think, is the place where we start with this. Um, and I have whole different you know, presentations I've been doing on this for clinical law professors and others. Um, but we can create trauma-responsive learning environments. We can 
um, teach students to be trauma sensitive and to take into account their own issues. So I think there's a number of ways we can do this and I'm happy to talk more about that. Um, but also just wanna talk about what we mean by self care. So if there's any parks and recreation fan, you'll know, you'll know that um, the concept of a couple of characters came up with of treat yourself. I'm actually talking about going beyond what they had as spa days and kind of retail therapy, although those might be self-care for you potentially, and that's fine. I'm not judging that. Um, but we're talking a little bit more broadly about self-care. Um, I like these two definitions that I'll put up. Um, so the practices we use to effectively manage or address trauma responses, exposure responses, and thereby enhance sustainability of our direct client work. So we want to do this for the long term. And then thinking about self-care as a preventative and restorative response to stress, burnout, and vicarious trauma. Lots of different things I'll throw up here. And I'm curious, um, you know, feel free to type into the chat maybe what you do if you're comfortable sharing for self-care and which of these resonate with you. Um, I do this as an exercise with my students. We do a little life well, and we have on the one side, what are the things that kind of drain us, drain our reserve of energy and enthusiasm for life and the work. And the other side, we have the things that replenish and fill us up. Um, so they're going to be different things on each side. Sometimes things are on both sides for me, like my kids are always on both sides because they both drain me, but they also energize me and give me a lot of joy every day. So all the classic things, right? Relaxation techniques, meditation, breathing, yoga, gratitude, having a hot bath. Um, humor is really important, right? Finding ways to connect with humor and laughter. Um, balancing things, obviously, and then all of these things fall under that. So thinking about what you're eating, your exercise, actually getting your heart rate up makes a big difference. Getting outside, this is all proven from studies um, that I could cite to you. Um, sleeping, right? Resolving any issues you have. Looks like I have getting outside and into nature twice. So I'm, I'm revealing my own biases there. Um, rituals and routines. This is really important, particularly in the area of COVID. Um, election turmoil and also the kind of reckoning we're having as a nation with racial injustice and racism. Um, but thinking about those boundaries between work and life, which are now harder. So how do you switch off at the end of the day? And when do you switch off? And when do you do your work? Um, debriefing, talking about these things with colleagues or supervisors is really important. Um, some people find uh, it really is helpful to write or journal about your feelings to therapy, individual or as, as a group, um, thinking about using another part of your brain, right? Recognizing that we are not just kind of repositories for information and lawyers, but we also have a need to engage in creative endeavors. And, you know, so some people really like the coloring or painting or art, doing something with their hands that's different. And then engaging with uh, our immigrant communities in different ways, in different ways without invading that space and being mindful of that. Um, but finding ways to engage that are not just working with people on their on their trauma traumatic cases. Um, just a couple more slides here. Um, so respecting your own needs and saying no, all these good things. Um, focusing on the rewards of working with survivors of trauma and torture. Um, gratitude practices. I've been writing down at the end of the day since COVID hit uh, five things every day that I'm grateful for, and I can always find at least five, big or small. Um, but with all of this self-care stuff, it's also about not judging yourself, right? And not <laughs> judging yourself and giving yourself a hard time for not doing enough self-care. So being kind to yourself, but finding ways to hold yourself accountable. So if you know that it's gonna be the last thing you'll do as it is for me, um, having a friend who, who holds you accountable and maybe you send each other a text every day saying what you've done. The last idea I just wanna share with you really is that, um, we need to go beyond just doing this in our own time at the weekends um, and in the evenings and actually think about doing this within the workplace or within law school. So um, there's really good studies that show that the cost of caring is catching. So if people are burned out, if they're suffering from compassion fatigue, um, it actually is something that spreads. This is a powerful quote that if you're not kind of taking into account burnout and compassion fatigue in the day-to-day -day operations of your law practice, you as an individual and also the agency widely are at much greater risk of developing numerous symptoms that like bacteria in a petri dish multiply and affect others. So this idea that you can actually create a negative and toxic environment. So we have a need to move beyond the individual self-care and think about institutional self-care. 
creating a culture of that being okay within an institution. And we can talk about why all of this is actually counter culture to mainstream legal and law school culture, which tends to be cutthroat, competitive. We don't acknowledge our feelings or weaknesses. We want to win all the cases all the time in the public interest social justice arena. We wanna burn down the systems and just make everything right. Um, and a lot of this is counter to that and it, it's in tension with those feelings. Um, so thinking about what is real time off, like what is the culture that you have around taking time, around overtime, vacation, um, a culture of appreciation and giving shout outs to each other. How is work distributed? Um, can we in our clinics bill time if you're tracking your hours for self care? Can you do that within a nonprofit or a law firm? Can it be built into the mission statement, into the evaluation process of an organization, into how you train? How are you providing kind of mental health benefits internally and externally to the organization? So again, a whole other presentation you could do on that. Um, likewise, obviously, a lot of this could be solved if we had a stronger, more robust immigration system that was independent and insulated from the whims of the political branch. So I'm not going to go into this in in detail, but obviously if we undid everything that the Trump administration has done, that would be a start, not sufficient in my view, but it would take us to a better place to work from, um, passing the Refugee Protection Act so that we could um, return to a more common sense understanding of particular social group that's not so convoluted and designed to keep people out. Um, having independent immigration courts and judges, um, abolishing immigration detention would also go a long way. So there's obviously a lot of immigration policy things that you could do. So just I'm throwing these at you um, at the end of this presentation. But I'm also just so grateful to you all for listening on a Friday afternoon. And I wanna invite questions and also just to feel free to reach out to me beyond this afternoon if anything I've said is interesting to you or you want to know more or would be helpful. So I'll leave my email address up for a second, but I know there may be questions. Professor Harris, thank you so much for that amazing talk. Um, it's important for everybody to get more educated on, you know, the specifics of what's what's happened and what's happening, um, but but also to you know think about what we can do, as you said, as an institution in in the law school and for ourselves. So we'll continue to do that, and we will read your article. We will reach out to you for you know suggestions and work with each other for how we improve i want to um so thank you so much i just want to give a thank you that, that was wonderful and we really appreciate i really appreciate you um i want to turn it over now to isai who's got some questions and will then be moderating the quest q a yeah so if everyone uh, that's attending just wants to use the raise hand feature in zoom or post in the uh, chat, I can call on each person individually as the questions come up. But I was going to start off with one question, kind of selfishly. <laughs> um, I just going off of kind of those last slides, I was wondering if you had just some practical words of advice um, to give to. I'm a 1L law student, but many other law students are in this too, um, who are aspiring immigration attorneys on how you would, we uh, as a community can already begin to engage in a practice of uh, trauma stewardship and cultivating resilience. And you touched a bit, a bit about it on the last slide, but I was wondering if you had some more words of advice. Yeah, I think it's really important. And I will say that when I was in law school, I remember going to a presentation on secondary trauma and I went to law school to work with asylum seekers. But I remember kind of sitting there and being like, yeah, 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 this isn't going to apply to me. You know, like I'll kind of listen to this, but not going to be a thing. And then, of course, you know, a couple of years out in practice where I had 80 to 100 cases, all of which were women fleeing gender based violence. Yes, it was a thing for me. <laughs> um, so I think, first of all, believing that, you know, stopping this this myth that you're going to be the exception and somehow you'll just tough it out um, because I think I was pretty tough and I you know but it still affected me and you're a human so you're going to be affected by the cases that you and the clients that you work with the incredibly resilient human beings you'll stand alongside and represent um, so I think acknowledging that it is a thing is the first step and then taking the time while you're in law school to figure out what works for you. I think law school is a unique 
time when you basically have, you know, no work-life balance. It's very difficult to achieve that, but I think you need to start to make steps in that direction. So I think thinking about, you know, this exercise that I do with my students where it's like, okay, what is something that really replenishes and energizes you? And what are the things that just bring you down? And so really taking the time to consider what are those refilling, those well rejuvenation activities that you can do and how do you build those into your life every day? And how do you hold yourself accountable and, and make sure that you're making time for that? Um, because really, you know, it is true. You can't pour from an empty cup and your representation is not gonna be good if you're tired or stressed or burnt out or overwhelmed. Um, so I think permitting ourselves to take the time for first self-care, which is a lot easier to preach than it is to actually do in your own life, I say, um, is really, really important because we want this to be sustainable for you like it was always hard doing this work um it will remain hard it has been infinitely harder for the last four years um but we want you in this for the long term we don't want to scare you away and we want it to be sustainable thank you professor um and i want to open up the floor now to any other questions and you can just use the raise hand feature on Zoom or post in the chat. Uh, Professor Lee. Hi, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Professor Harris. This was such a great presentation and also such an important study. And I think really crystallized, you know, what a lot of us knew working in this field was really an issue. And I guess my question was really just, whether um, you'd looked into comparative studies at all or know of studies for other types of attorneys or other fields of law. And I was thinking especially about public defenders, just mm -hmm. from public defenders I know, I know that this has been an issue in a lot of those systems for a long time as well. So yeah, that was basically my question. Yeah, that was actually one of the first places that I looked as I started to try and figure out this area. Um, so there are a few studies of criminal defense attorneys, um, not as many as you would think, and actually none of them are as big as mine. I was shocked to be, my study is actually the biggest in terms of the number of people surveyed. Um, that won't be for long because there's a very big study being done with DC bar members and California bar members soon, so we'll have better data on that. Um, but there have been studies specifically of criminal lawyers and family lawyers. Um, and they do have similar findings in terms of the gender breakdown that uh, people who identify as female tend to have higher levels of these problematic phenomena. Um, and then also along the, the working hours and the trauma exposure. So it does seem like the, it's not just the working hours though, um, it's, it's the type of cases. So it is, you know, if you, they're getting more granular, the studies, although they're not that great. But broadly, I can say that my findings do mirror what we're seeing in um, criminal law for criminal defense and for family lawyers. The other issue is that the metrics in, the, in terms, terms of the psychology literature are like constantly changing. So that's one of the reasons I wanted to use these two scales that had been used in the immigration context before um, with immigration judges, even though there are these other tools and things that have developed, but people are often using very different tools to measure um, these different, uh, you know, mental health diagnoses or essentially things that we're trying to mention, you know, assess symptomology on, uh, symptomatology. So it's hard to kind of draw comparisons in a really precise way, but it does seem like, yes, the folks who are doing criminal defense work. And also there was one very small study of people who were doing prosecution of sex crimes um, and they similar results on the attorneys in terms of their mental health. Thank you. Um, and as we wait for a few more questions to go in, I did have another question, uh, kind of going back to the earlier material. Um, and it was just on all these policies that the current administration has been passing, um, like MPP and metering at the border. Um, and I read an article that kind of framed it as like building an invisible wall and specifically kind of countering that with how the administration has failed to uphold its original campaign promise of building a physical wall. So I just kind of, want to know what you thought about that. And then just in light of the election next week, um, what is kind of the realistic pro uh, process and timeline do you think for changing or pushing back on a lot of these policies that have been passed? 
Mm, yeah, really great questions. So I think that there's been a few pieces that have kind of talked about this invisible wall, or I know Ming Su Chen, um, who's an immigration scholar, just wrote a piece on something she called the paper wall um, in the LA Times. And I think that yeah, I think what you're getting at is, um, yes, this administration has been wildly more successful in building their invisible wall or paper wall than they seem to have been in building an actual wall. Um, I don't actually follow the border wall that much because, you know, apropos the last hour, there's been enough for me to focus on and, and keep up to speed on. So I don't really know how many miles of wall they've managed to build, but it, it seems like what they've been far more impressive in their other barriers to uh, immigration relief and protection uh, in many ways. And I think the question is, how do we undo all of that, right? How do we take down the invisible wall? And in the piece I wrote, um, Asylum Under Attack, that's really what I try and do. I try and kind of chronicle what has been done and then kind of provide a roadmap or a blueprint for hopefully the Biden-Harris administration um, for what they need to do to not only undo it, but also go beyond that. I do think that you know Biden has outlined a number of actions that I think he's committed to taking within the first 100 days. Um, but I do, you know, some of the regulatory reform and not an admin law scholar, and perhaps there are some among us who may be able to help. Um, I think that it's possible to halt the rulemakings before they are finalized. But then once they are, it's, it's, I know it's a lot easier if there are legal challenges and advocates have been very good at lining up legal challenges and bringing them in a timely way to each set of proposed regulations. Usually we have the proposed regulations and then we have 60 days before they go into effect. So as long as we challenge within that 60 day window, um, then we have a chance to, to stop whatever harm is, is coming our way. So there's a lot, there's a lot that Biden could do, you know, through executive order. Um, but I think he really is going to have to dig in and support. Um, and hopefully he'll have the, the support in the House and the Senate to do this, but to pass some of the more progressive legislation like the Refugee Protection Act, which would help to insulate, um, you know, the process and the asylum definition from being attacked in the same way in the future, if you had some of these things built into the statute. And then the same with, I think it's you know going to be a big ask getting to an independent immigration court system. But likewise, if that was actually set up successfully, then we would, wouldn't would see a lot of the same issues that we have seen recurring that have, have, are always at risk of recurring again. I welcome other thoughts on that as well, not just my own. No, thank in. you. No, <laughs> that was a great response to my question. Uh, it just puts that much stress on next week for sure, but um, there was a question in the chat from Virgil and it was, uh, did you find in your study uh, move out of asylum practice? Yeah, so it's not a question I asked in terms of a yes, no, maybe kind of multiple choice response, but the, question, the comments that came in in the open-ended question at the end did reveal that. Um, I think there were at least 24 people who wrote that they were leaving asylum practice. And a lot of them did reference specifically leaving asylum practice if Trump is reelected. And, you know, just, I think anecdotally, I see that all the time, you know, I, I, a lot of um, immigration lawyering has like moved to Facebook. Like there are all these big groups of nerdy immigration lawyers, cool immigration lawyers, mom immigration lawyers. And there's a lot of discussion there with hundreds of comments and responses on like, who's leaving the practice if Trump's reelected. And, you know, a lot of people say they are, and people have already started making shifts in the last four years to different types of law practice. Some of the respondents in my survey said they were just done being a lawyer. Um, their faith in the legal system was undermined. Um, a couple of people referenced that they were going to take early retirement. They hadn't been planning to retire, but they were going to. So yes, there definitely was uh, a strong current in the written in responses of people who were moving away from asylum practice and also removal defense more generally. Not shocking. Thank you. Yeah. It, it is hard, especially for, I think, 1Ls and, and students, too, who want to go into this. Uh, it was difficult reading the article uh, for myself, too. Um, and I think Professor Lee had a follow-up question. Oh, thank you. So actually, Professor Harris, this is based on your answer. And just really briefly, you mentioned in the presentation that there was a gender difference. And I was wondering if there's anything either in the multiple choice or in the unstructured responses that um, points to a reason why that is, or if you have any thoughts on that. So there, 
there wasn't in the multiple choice and I'm kind of kicking myself like what could I have done like to get to this there were a couple of people who wrote in that they would be curious you know as a as a woman and also like these are some of the post pandemic responses juggling childcare responsibilities or other caregiving responsibilities um, that was really compounding things there were a couple of people who wrote in and in their responses identified as a woman and talked about how doing this work was harder for them emotionally as a mother um, and especially, I think, given what we've seen in the last four years um, around child se family separation, people who are working with kids and did work with those separated families in particular, and people doing work at the border with the families who are living in, you know, these informal camp settlements in terrible conditions. So there was, I mean, I guess my personal <laughs> bias too, as a mother who is doing this work is that, yeah, this is really stressful. And, and I think women were higher on the kind of personal burnout dimension as well, if you look at kind of the more granular results. So I think that there is an aspect of, of potentially mothering of childcare. There certainly weren't any um, people who identified as men and talked about their children in the responses, but I did see that from people who self identified as, as mothers. I, think, I don't know if Can Vincent I... had a question too, but I saw his hand at one point. Yeah, go ahead, Vincent. You know what? Uh, you actually answered my question aside. Or, or asked my question about sort of what of this do we anticipate being unwound if there's a uh, change in administration coming up here soon? Yeah, and I think the key to that too is is not falling asleep, right? Like I do feel like, you know, I think for those of us, particularly in the family detention arena where we were out protesting in the streets in very small numbers, we could not get people to protest Obama's family detention policies. And he did really, do away with family detention and then resurrect family detention in 2018 in a big way. So, you know, I remember taking my one year old out and we were both like chanting and holding signs like she was chanting for months afterwards, Obama, Obama, don't lock up the mamas. Um, and, you know, we just couldn't get people engaged in that advocacy. And so it just wasn't effective. Um, we'd be standing outside the White House on Mother's Day, delivering flowers and cards to Michelle Obama and Valerie Jarrett and Jill Biden saying like, hey, pay attention, moms. Um, and, and people just weren't engaged. And so we absolutely cannot rest on our laurels if uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are elected. We need to keep up the pressure um, because we have to make it um, you know, politically important for them to take the measures that they should be taking ethically, morally, you know, from a humanitarian perspective here. Um, we absolutely, even though we're exhausted, <laughs> we have to keep up the momentum and, and hold them accountable to do what they said they were going to do and more, I would say. Yeah. And I believe uh, Professor Lawrence also had a question. Yeah, hi, Lindsay, I just wondered if you could tell us or share some thoughts that you might have about um, non-immigration lawyers who take on asylum cases pro bono. Like, so I think um, you probably encountered this and I know and there are a number of practitioners who encountered this. Um, certainly as an expert from time to time, I get cases where people have said, well, I've just taken on this case because I was encouraged by my local county bar association. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And um, how can, uh, how can we assist or like, you know, what can the lawyers do to assist or so something like that? Yeah, so I, I am really familiar with that. One of my first jobs, um, you know, was at the Tahere Justice Center where their model is you have some of your cases in house, but then you mentor pro bono attorneys on many of your cases. I think their ideal is like 75% of your cases, you're mentoring pro bono attorneys on these cases. So attorneys who are working at large law firms who have no background often or experience in asylum, um, sometimes they've taken a clinic or something in law school, which is tremendously helpful, but often they're not super cognizant of the issues they um, don't necessarily have the kind of background and trauma informed lawyering as well that would be helpful and important but they're so important um, as as part of the you know panoply of, of people who represent asylum seekers because they come with incredible resources um, they often staff three or four associates to a case 
Um, they have financial resources to actually pay experts, right? So a, a fantastic country conditions expert such as yourself, I know we've worked together in the past, you know, at a nonprofit or at a law school clinic, you have really limited means to pay. Um, so once in a while, it's really nice when a, a law firm can come in and actually pay someone for what they should be paid. Um, and, and similar with medical experts and others. So they, they play a really important role. And I think the studies also show that they, um, have high levels of success in terms of the, the most successful actually uh, in immigration court are the clinics, <laughs> but clinic, clinics and pro bono attorneys, big, um, but that's only 2% of representation in immigration court. I think that was the finding from Ingrid Eagley's work um, and her big study of immigration courts. So very important, very successful. Um, also not very traumatized or burnt out according to my study, the people who that's, identified- That's what I was wondering, right? Yeah, they do okay. To... <laughs> is it a sort of a pipeline yeah. to sort of disperse yeah. some of the exhaustion and stress, but also to develop yeah. more capacity? Right. Like and I mean, maybe, it, maybe some programs to actually encourage more lawyers to take yeah. on individual cases, even though I do recognize that some yeah. immigration experts have reservations about non expert yeah. taking on these cases. It's better it's than nobody, important. surely. Super important and AILA, the American Immigration Law so Lawyers Association's immigration justice campaign has been really good at doing that. They took like, they got like 7,000 lawyers who signed up during the family separation crisis, um, you know, Trump manufactured crisis. And exactly. they- Exactly, uh, I was thinking about them that. Up. They trained them up and, and they are engaged in this work. And it's really, really important. Um, I think it also, when you are at a nonprofit doing the kind of mentoring of pro bono attorneys, in terms of your trauma exposure, it is managed a little bit because there is someone else doing the direct interviewing. It's the same as being a law professor, right? So being a law professor, you have this distance mm -hmm. and it is a more sustainable thing um, because you aren't directly interfacing and hearing their traumatic stories. It's one thing to interview the client and get their information for a de detailed declaration. It's another other to read it there's still some trauma in that in reading and editing and giving students feedback but it's not the same um it's the same with pro bono attorneys so i think you know the more people we can involve uh i'm all for that but it, i think we just have to be careful about the kind of training this area of law is so complex at this point so it's kind of like a little bit of knowledge can be a dangerous thing we want to make sure people have the proper mentorship and guidance to take on this case these cases mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's a question uh, from Vincent. Go ahead, Vincent. You, you know, to that point, it, I, I was kind of interested in, in sort of the collision of a couple of factors here, right? One, um, sort of the stress levels that go along with solo practitioners versus the stress levels of uh, practitioners who have assistance and, and people helping them out. And, and this notion of um, a fully qualified immigration attorney versus someone who's really experienced at filling out super persnickety government forms and making sure that the state addresses are both cat, you know, the abbreviations are both capitalized where there's, there's an NA in every box. Um, it, it, it's kind of an interesting opportunity for division of labor here because a lot of the challenge seems to be making sure that all of these filings go exactly on time and are exactly correct. And while lawyers are very detail oriented and maybe a good person to do that, perhaps not the best, right? I, I mean, to, there could be an immigration attorney supervising a relatively large number of um, paper filler outers um, to, to kind of spread that burden and spread that load, take advantage of, uh, the lowered levels of stresses that come from having help, you know, that aren't necessarily lawyers. Yeah, I think that's a really valid point. And I think um, that's something that one of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a couple of law professor colleagues around here. One of our colleagues at Villanova, Michelle, P Michelle Pistone, has actually been trying to do that and to train up a whole core of people who are non-lawyers, but who could have real substantive training um, and, and help with some of that. I think there's always ethical issues involved, right? So I know that um, Ayla actually advises against having anyone sign the forms as the 
preparer other than the attorney, um, which was actually kind of news to me because I'm, I'm often having my students sign the forms, but apparently that's not like ethical according to a lot of people. Um, so, you know, you can report me if you want. Um, but I, I do think that there are some ethical issues around it, but we have to find ways of expanding the pool of people to do this work, especially while it remains such an inhumane and dysfunctional bureaucratic system. Um, we, we do, we need all the help that we can can get and engaging people on different levels is important, but it does require, you know, incredible oversight, training, supervision, a whole program, you know, as Professor Marcus is saying in the chat to ensure that you really are um, covering your bases ethically and providing consistent high quality representation as well. You know, you're almost- I, I wanna, I'm, so, I'm sorry, Vincent, I wanna respect everybody's time and we go into 115 formally. Um, so anyone who needs to, to leave, thank you so much for coming. Um, Professor Harris has said she can stay a little bit longer if there's more questions. So, um, so I'm just gonna continue on for those who for those who want to stay. And everybody else, uh, have a great day. Well, let's thank you. Vincent. You know, I was just gonna mention that might be an interesting opportunity for a little technology assistant. Um, if there's software or something that could help with the form filling out or form validation or something like that. I, I know that there's innovation for justice programs here at Arizona, but, but also at other schools that that could potentially be a uh, alternative to having somebody kind of originate and sign these forms is to have them sort of double checked by some sort of expert system. I don't know if you've thought much about that. Yeah, it's something I've been thinking about. I was actually just teaching a course to my students on counseling yesterday, and I was using just to kind of get their brains thinking about what is counseling, what is lawyering. Um, I use the example of do not pay, which is this system set up by this like 19 year old Stanford um, whiz. He's not 19 anymore, but he set it up a few years ago. And it's basically a robo lawyering system initially created to help people contest parking tickets. Yet he has also been expanding it to advising asylum seekers seeking asylum in the UK and Canada, Arabic speaking asylum seekers. I'm not quite sure how far he's gone with it yet, um, but there's obviously pros and cons to that. I do think that some people are doing really good work in this arena. So um, Innovation Law Lab, which is Stephen Manning's group that you might be familiar with, um, out of Portland, Oregon. They've been involved in initially in a lot of the family detention work and then in the work at the border for people in MPP and in El Paso in particular. And they've been doing incredible work to try and kind of create better systems and to systematize things and to be more efficient. And so that we can kind of crowdsource the lawyering, like you could come in for a week and play an important role and then you pass the case on to somebody else because you know we can't all be living and working down on the border all the time. And yet that is where so much of this work needs to be done. Um, so they have some really good ideas and I think would probably appreciate your ideas and connections that you may have, you know, with your university internally as well. I did get one question um, in the chat, if it's okay to share, John, is that okay to, do you want to sh state your question? It just came to me. <laughs> John, you're on mute. Yeah. So I can state the question. So John had this great question about recognizing that one form of depression is where you turn your anger into yourself and an antidote is to create some form of action. So would it make sense to initiate criminal lawsuits against Sessions, Miller, Stephen Miller, right? Who's the architect behind so much of all of this and friends um, for crimes against humanity, child abuse, kidnapping, et cetera. Um, I think that, yeah, I think there's certainly a place for that and there's going to be a place for that and I think that you know should we <laughs> should the tide turn next week and some change be on the horizon I'm curious to see what others think about um, whether there is going to be I mean international accountability mechanisms are very weak but I could see some cases potentially being brought right before the the, the ICC and the Hague or elsewhere or or domestically as well to try and hold Trump and cronies accountable for some of the things that they've done it certainly would be satisfying and, and to see that happen. Um, but I would also, for me, I turn some of my rage into action into like, okay, well, I can spend this one hour doing this thing for this one person, or I can motivate, you know, 10 more people to write comments or 
just try and stay positive by action. I think that sometimes we can get really paralyzed by how overwhelming everything is. Um, so doing something, it may be those things that you mentioned or it may be something else. Thank you. Thank you. I finally got unmuted. Okay. <laughs> it's an issue every time, every time. So Actually, you... I have a very minor follow-up to it. Who would be a logical party to bring the suit? One of the one of the children who um, who was separated. Obviously, they're minors. Obviously, they're infants, or not always. Yeah. But yeah. So I think we have been seeing that a little bit. So um, I know the American Immigration Council and Partners just brought a suit under the Federal Tort Claims Act for um, at least one child, maybe it's more, um, who have been separated. And so we are gonna be seeing some FTCA claims actually in my clinic. I'm actually currently teaching at American. Um, I'm covering someone's sabbatical and I'm directing their international human rights law clinic. So we actually have a couple of FTCA claims pending uh, for Honduran families who now have been taken back to Honduras, but for that period of months where they were separated from their kids, they have federal tort claims acts pending against the federal government. That's not really suing people in their individual capacity, um, but yeah, I'm definitely not an expert on that, but I do think your easiest plaintiffs are people directly affected um, by the harm perpetrated, right? logically, but anyone else feel free to jump in with, with legal strategies on that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for so many great questions and for listening to me talk for way too long. I'm sorry that that was lengthy. <laughs> no, we are, we are not sorry that that was lengthy. We are, <laughs> we are grateful to you for everything that, you know, all the time that you gave us and um, the materials that you shared with us too to follow up with and um, I'm gonna yeah. go to your next um, to your next interview prep, or maybe for a stretch and uh, or a, a little. I think walk it's gonna outside. be it's gonna be lunch. <laughs> it's like 4:20. <laughs> We're gonna let you go eat some lunch. A little little bit of lunch, um, yeah, in the self care arena, and then probably engaging with my kids. I have a six year old dressed as a witch who's been doing um, her school today remotely for Halloween, which is quite a scene. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you once again, Lindsay. It was really wonderful. Thanks for the invitation. I'm honored, so especially to speak after Karen and Fatma. I mean, just incredible, incredible women that I admire and aspire to, to follow. So thank you all. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Marcus. Bye-bye.